Coming up today on Studio 13 Live, the cast of Ted Lasso is set to meet with the president and first lady today. How one storyline in the show about mental health is making its way to the White House. Plus, on the first day of a new season, we're learning how to make some fun spring cocktails. Joining us in studio is author and mixologist Nick Matone. Then we're sitting down with the lead dancers from the Pacific Northwest Ballet's production of Snow White. And Cycle Dogs is dishing up some plant-based elote hot dogs. Studio 13 Live starts right now. I want to see you smile, take you another mile. Don't gotta wait, don't gotta wait, don't gotta wait today. Happy Monday. I am so glad you're here with us today. We're so excited to have you. I'm Carly Henderson. And I'm Maria Garcia. And it is the start of a new week and a new season. Happy first day of spring happy to you. Happy first day of spring. Yeah. So, I'm so happy about that. It's no longer going to be dark at 4 o'clock, which to be perfectly honest, I hadn't like super noticed because we go to bed so early. But, you yeah. know, I'm happy for the rest of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy for the greater good. It's also been throwing me off, too, because normally it would get dark so early and I'd be mm -hmm. like, oh, now is my time to like sit on the couch and veg out a little bit and like watch watch my little show or yeah. whatever but now I feel like lazy doing that when it's light for some bright, reason yes and it's bright and it like I don't know I have I have to look at the clock and I'm like oh my gosh it's eight o'clock I need to go to bed right now <laughs> uh, I don't love it mindset change I, I know. think needs but to it was a beautiful weekend and we actually got to do something super fun on Saturday we did. so we both won this company raffle to get to go to the Sounders game and we went with our respective families and it was so much fun it was just great to be out there the sun was shining <laughs> Saturday was such a beautiful day. It really was. Was that your first time at Lumen Field? It, it was mine. It was. It was my first time at Lumen Field, and it was my son's first uh, game, uh, yeah. or soccer game, you know, and he really loved it. He got a little confused and was trying to explain to Carly that we were having fun watching <laughs> basketball. <Yeah. laughs> and I said, no, honey, that's soccer. Or football, you know, either one, but not basketball. I did shoot this very cute little TikTok, so let's show that to you. I, yeah. I was going to say, too, your son and I both like to enjoy sporting events in the same way, which is just snacking out the whole Lots time. Lots of too. snacks, yeah. We both had our snack game on lock. Absolutely. It was, I, it was really funny walking <laughs> from, you know, the food court area to the to the suite there because yeah. it was like two boxes of candy, two <laughs> bags of chips, and a drink, and it was all for him. Yeah. <laughs> but he was mellow the whole time, which I appreciate. He was great. He did well. <laughs> that was it was so much fun. Yeah, it was great. All right. Well, we do have a special serenade for actor Bruce Willis. Okay, the actor celebrated his 68th birthday with his family yesterday. To you, happy birthday. Look at that. So, you know, and this crew really takes the word family very seriously. This video is from his ex-wife, Demi Moore, posted it of Willis's current wife, daughters, other family members, all singing happy birthday to him, of course. And you'll remember that Willis actually stepped away from acting last year after being diagnosed with aphasia, which affects the ability to speak and understand language. And his family said last month that his condition had actually progressed and that he'd been diagnosed with a rare form of dementia. But it is beautiful to see them celebrating life in any way that they can. I know, I love to see these happy moments too. I'll also say, having someone sing happy birthday to you, it's always such an awkward experience. And I always feel so awkward. He like looks cool doing it. He I don't does. know how, he's just like handling it, receiving it, yes. it's great. But I always feel so awkward. I, I never, never know, know where to look. Yeah. You feel like you have to Do smile the whole time. <laughs> don't sing, it's your birthday. Yeah, Yeah. no, absolutely. Well, that was great. <laughs> and of course, one of my favorite, favorite shows, the cast of Ted Lasso, they're actually set to meet 
with the president and first lady today and they're going to be talking about a very important topic mental health and overall well-being and you know if you watch that show you'll remember that that was a huge storyline for the second season as the titular character Ted Lasso deals with anxiety attacks mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people can relate with uh, and it's uh, clear that the cast really buys into the whole believe in the main topic from the show. Absolutely, it's amazing to see. And I feel like the first season too, I mean, you got a little bit of a taste of it toward the end of the season as you got to know his character a little bit mm -hmm. better. Um, but it was nice to see that go so much deeper in the second season and to, not, to realize not everyone who seems really happy-go-lucky is naturally that way. A lot of people have to work really hard to be okay. And I'm just thankful that like talking about mental health has come such a long way in the last like even 10 or 15 years. I feel like it was so taboo when we were growing up. Yeah. So it's amazing to see you know celebrities and take their take their job as role models really seriously and um, you know make the world a little bit better so yeah nice and I do that. I do like to see that here in this third season I mean no spoilers you guys yes. I promise but that theme certainly continues and I think that the character Ted Lasso as you pointed out, has some very interesting ways of being open and honest about mm -hmm. his struggles that really just makes it a lot easier not to feel shame about whatever you're going through. Absolutely, we love to see it. Well, if you have looked at social media at all since Friday <laughs> night, chances are you have seen a lot about Taylor Swift's new Eras tour. The tour kicked off in Arizona over the weekend and this show did not disappoint fans. So Swifties are most excited about her 44 song performance. 44 songs, wow. a bunch of outfit changes, extravagant choreography. Some Seattle fans have even gone viral saying that watching all of the videos from the weekend has just made them realize how long they have to wait for the show because Swift will be at Lumen Field on July 22nd and July 23rd. So that is quite the wait. And I have to say, uh, our executive producer, Bavisha, has been sending me TikToks mm -hmm. of people, you know, who were at that concert. But my own For You page has also been flooded with this content. And not once did any of those videos overlap. Like, she never wow. sent me a video that I'd already seen. Yeah. There's just that much going that on. That much content. Because <laughs> she performed for three hours and 15 minutes. I mean, can you imagine doing that night after night after night? Like, I, I want to see. I want to see the behind the scenes. I want to see the documentary of the Eras yes. tour. I want to see what Taylor had to do to train to get into this kind of shape. Because who can do anything for three hours and fifteen minutes without taking a break? The longest I think she took a break was like three minutes for a quick like <gasps> outfit change behind the scene. I don't know if you saw that one where she's like diving underneath the right? stage. Yeah, she that jumps looks down. So cool. I want to know how that happens. Yeah. So it's been really cool to get all this content. And it makes me think too, with all these amazing behind the scenes clips that are surfacing from all tours, even like Harry Styles' concert, right. which felt like he was on tour forever as well. But it, it makes me feel like it, artists probably have to be a little bit more original with the things that they say to the audience. Because when we were growing yeah. up, I feel like you'd go to a concert and they'd be like, Seattle, you're the best fans in the world, da -da -da -da, and tell a little story. But then you kind of know they're saying that to Philadelphia and they're saying that to Denver as well. But now that everything on TikTok, I feel like artists have to keep it really original and really real. Yeah, I so. think that they do. And I do know that in the Eras tour, Taylor Swift is going out of her way to perform like one song. And I think it's the acoustic set yeah. that is different in most, if not all the cities, which yeah. I think is, is exactly what you were touching on there, mm -hmm. like trying to make it original for the city, which we love to see. And I, I do have plans to go to the concert in Seattle. I'm yes. so excited, yes. but yeah, I cannot wait. Whew. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> definitely makes it a little bit better that you're getting so much value for your money, even yes. though everyone had to pay so much for those tickets yeah. because Taylor's given you a lot. She knows, she acknowledges the extraordinary lengths you went through to yes. get the ticket. And we appreciate so, it. That's great. <laughs> Another pop queen, Selena Gomez, officially became the first woman to reach 400 million followers on Instagram over the weekend less than a month ago. She became the most followed woman on Instagram, again, beating out Kylie Jenner. Gomez recently returned to posting after being away for about four years. She says her Instagram became her whole world, which is why she had to take a break, it got very dangerous, and it made her feel like she always had to wear makeup. It makes yeah. me realize how much the aesthetic of Instagram has changed in the last few years too, because remember when it was like, making your life look perfect and curated? Yes. I would even do like full on photo shoots for Instagram right. back in the day. And now it's like the Gen Z just made it cool to do photo dumps where you have like your eyes half closed and it's almost a cooler picture yeah. in that way. And of course, like videos change it so much too. But yeah, it's changed a lot since then. But wow, Selena Gomez, more followers than people in America. 
that is wild to me, but I do appreciate what Gen Z has done for Instagram. Yeah. Because honestly, way back when I got a recommendation from someone in the in uh, the journalism industry uh -huh. saying that I should consider posting Instagram content or videos without makeup on. And I scoffed. I couldn't believe oh, that yeah. recommendation. I thought it was like terrible. Yeah. I do that all the time now. I yeah. guess I just wasn't ready back then. But yeah. Yeah. I think it's people and, appreciate And now we it. have that good little Paris filter where you just smooth it out a little bit. You One just swipe, swipe once and smooth it out. And it's you, but just with extra light. You yeah. Know? Just good light, <laughs> even lighting. <laughs> Fix the complexion a little bit. I'm here for it. Um, actor Adam Sandler was honored with the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor during a ceremony last night. The 56-year-old comedian rose to fame after being cast on Saturday Night Live in 1991. After being fired, he launched his movie career. And since then, Sandler has starred in over 30 films, which grossed more than $3 billion worldwide. <laughs> that is wow. amazing. Wow. This makes me want to go back and watch all the old SNL clips of him because I never really, I, I didn't watch SNL when he was on growing up. So mm -hmm. it's, it, there's so many like comedy legends that I love so much that have come from that show that I never watched back then, like Fred Armisen, Molly Shannon. I've gone back and watched some of her clips, but it's, it's always good to find those on YouTube and watch those old SNL clips. Well, if any dads needed another reason to keep making <laughs> bad jokes, a new study <laughs> argues Dad jokes can have a positive impact on child development, huh? Findings suggest that telling wholesome, usually corny jokes may teach kids resilience. The study encourages fathers to take part in telling dad jokes because it also empowers kids to overcome awkwardness. I love okay. it, I love it. I, I love that. a cheesy joke. I love a corny dad joke. Tell me your favorite corny joke. Okay, what kind of pants do Mario and Luigi wear? What kind? Denim, denim, denim. <laughs> that's very was that good. A real laugh? That, 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 that was pretty good. No, girl, I'm lying to you. I hate dad jokes, but that was pretty good. All right, I actually got mine from my husband, who loves the dad yeah. joke, uh, to my chagrin. Uh, I don't consider gluten-free pasta or gluten-free. I already messed it up. Gluten-free <laughs> spaghetti, real pasta, because it's an impasta. Uh, bum, bum. I messed up that joke. Sorry, Nick, but I don't like them. I do agree, though, that they are deeply awkward and can definitely help kids overcome any sort of issue. Yeah, because people are awkward. You're going to meet awkward people in your life, and you got to yeah. kind of be nice to them or know what to do when they Roll say your eyes, things. laugh at yourself, <laughs> move on with your life. Yeah. All right, we also, well, Carly wants to hear your favorite dad jokes. You <laughs> I can, do. You can leave me out of it. Uh, <laughs> so send them to us on social media, Studio 13 on Fox. <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading those. <laughs> good, we good. love a corny you can, joke. You can pick your favorites, and okay. I, I'll listen to those, okay? Yeah. Uh, coming up on Studio 13 Live, it is time for some top entertainment headlines with TMZ. Yes, retired NFL player J.J. Watt has a lot to say about Taylor Swift's new tour. We are sharing his insight next. Ooh. It is time to take a look at what is popping in the world of celebrity news. And for that, we are bringing in Fabian Garcia from TMZ. Hey, Fabian. Hey, good morning, you guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, happy Monday. Good to see you. So JJ mm -hmm. Watt has gone from football to concert critic in his <laughs> retirement. I hear he has a lot of thoughts about Taylor Swift's Eras Tour. Yeah, and not a lot of criticisms, actually. A lot of praise. Oh. Uh, he took to social media with a lengthy video, a lengthy review, and it is glowing for Taylor Swift. Uh, as you guys might know, she is on tour right now. The Eras Tour, as it's called, highly anticipated. A lot of controversy with Ticketmaster, et cetera. But now she's on tour. Uh, and according to J.J. Watt, she impresses. She does a full three-hour-plus set, hardly any breaks in between, he claims. He says there was a, maybe the only period of time that she took a break was about three minutes for a costume change, he says. But then she was right back on stage performing again, belting out her, her songs. I think he said like 44 songs in her three hour set covering all the hits, obviously. Uh, so yeah, I've never been to a Taylor Swift concert. I oh. probably will never go to a Taylor Swift concert, <laughs> oh. but, but based on JJ Watt's review here, I, I just might, cause it sounds quite impressive. And I, I mean, it kind of just speaks to Taylor Swift as a performer, as an artist, this is what she does. And she is a top tier performer. And according to JJ Watt, she's one of the best. 
Oh, absolutely. One of my favorite things is seeing newly converted Taylor Swift fans. That is yes. very fun. And I brought like my boyfriend to Taylor Swift concerts before and it wasn't okay. necessarily his choice of an artist, but he accompanied me to them. Yes. And he had a really good time. I feel like and like uh, uh, everything about it, the theatrics of the concerts, anyone will become so, a Taylor Swift fan. So you can confirm, you can confirm JJ Watts' report then confirm. is what you're saying. I can confirm it. I wasn't there, <laughs> okay. but I can confirm. And you know what Good I love? Know. JJ Watt, known for being a kind man who is extremely hardworking as an athlete. So I do yes. love that he's giving that love out, you know, to a, a performer who is putting in the work for her fans. Yeah. Absolutely. They're one and the same for sure. All right. So TMZ has a new special airing tonight on Fox. It's called TMZ Investigates 9-11, the fifth plane. What can you tell us about this one? Yeah, this is this is an interesting one. It's our latest documentary. We've been working on it for the past six months now. Um, and it's a deep dive into the crew from uh, United Flight 23. So this plane uh, was there on September 11th. They were supposed to be departing from JFK to LAX that morning around 9 a.m., right around the time when the other two planes were crashing. Um, this plane did not take off. They got word of the crashes, so they were they were grounded. But when, when we spoke to when we spoke to these crew members, including the pilot, including flight attendants, they say they feel like they were supposed to be the fifth plane that day. There's a lot of reasons. One, the flight the flight attendants say they saw some suspicious passengers in first class acting super strange. Uh, and that sort of seemed to fit the profile for hijackers that were hijacking planes that day. There's also the fact that when the plane was eventually evacuated, there were crew members on the ground, uh, baggage people, who supposedly saw some people running through the plane that were uniformed that should not have been on there because it was locked after the fact. When they went back in to kind of investigate what was going on, who was running around, was told that there was the hatch, one of the hatches, from like the tarmac to get into the plane was actually open, unexplained. And lastly, the FBI interviewed all of those people. They interviewed the flight attendants. They interviewed the captain and the pilots. Uh, and that seems to us to suggest that they seem to think that there might have been something to what these people are saying, namely the fact that they thought they were the fifth plane. There were also box cutters found in an adjacent plane that was not scheduled to take mm. off that morning. And what, what one of the captains tells us is that he thinks that one of the potential hijackers might have mistakenly put those box cutters in that plane thinking it was the, their plane. So all these things are laid out in the documentary in, in great detail, great depth. Um, it's probably one of our best produced documentaries. I know we're very proud of it. It's very interesting. We, we, we're speaking to a former member of Congress. We're speaking to somebody who was on the 9-11 Commission. And they're also kind of backing up the notion that, yes, this may, in fact, have been a fifth plane. Um, it's interesting. And I think folks are going to want to tune in for it. I can't wait to see that. Yeah. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. So it airs tonight at 9 p.m. here. Fabian Garcia, thank you so much. For sure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. All right, coming up, author and mixologist Nick Mottone is showing us how to make some spring-inspired drinks. Yeah, you can uh, see how you can use hibiscus petals and edible flowers to brighten up your cocktails and mocktails this season. Cannot wait. It is time for Seattle Sips, where we check out some amazing drinks in our area. Yeah, today we are joined by author and mixologist Nick Mottone, uh, who's going to be showing us how to make some spring cocktails. And let me tell you, it smells like spring in here. It's so I good. Look at the spa. It's very floral. It's I wonderful. know. We're asking for massages yeah. already, right? <laughs> That's not what you're here for, no, though, Nick. That is not later. what you're here yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, you know, we are so excited to have you. And Thank you've you. actually written several books on how to make the perfect cocktail for every occasion. So with spring here, here, what is a good cocktail for that? Great. So I'm a big fan of edible flowers on mm -hmm. a variety of different levels. I use them in, uh, in both cooking and, and cocktails extensively. Uh, my two favorites, and I'm going to show you those uh, two cocktails today, one is roses and one is hibiscus. So I'm going to do a bunch, but there's a few here. Lavender petals, hibiscus, jasmine, rose petals, rosebuds, edible orchids, put that in your salad. Ooh. And one of my new favorites, butterfly pea flowers, which when you make a drink with it, turns it a vibrant 
awesome blue. It's oh, the only I'm natural so blue color. For that. Yeah. And we're not going to use that today. Okay. 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 But, but we I'm can gonna, play with it later. You can play with it later. Yeah. Yeah. You can play with it later. <laughs> so what are we making today? All right. So we're going to make you two mocktails. Now, this is my entertaining tip, right? Mm -hmm. I make a pitcher of a mocktail and allow the guests who do want to drink to be able to pour a little alcohol into their beverage when they're ready to go. So I'm going to make you two mocktails. We'll go from Good there and tips. I'll talk about how to do yeah. it that way. That's great. And for me, it's all about making a pitcher, right? I don't want to be the bartender all night. I want to have fun with my guests. So yeah. I make a batch of cocktails, have it ready to go, yeah. and, then we're, and then we're ready to party. Yeah, Let's excellent. Okay. Let's do it. So this first cocktail is called Island Rose. And what I'm going to do is put a few rosebuds in here. This is going to make it extraordinarily fragrant. Beautiful. I'm going to put a couple of drops of orange flower water. Oops, sorry, rose water. Oh, <laughs> you almost made up a new almost cocktail. Almost made a cold mistake. <laughs> so okay. where do you buy these uh, dry flowers or even the edible flowers that we see here? Um, you can buy them online. Orchids and nasturtiums you can get in a, a, you know, a great grocery store, uh -huh. and, you know, even Whole Foods and Met Market and places like that here mm -hmm. uh, carry a lot of that stuff. So it, it's um, easy to find. These, the dried ones I got online, they were completely easy to get. So yeah. let me just tell you what I've got here. Yeah. Uh, first was blood orange juice. I happen to love blood orange because it's a little bit more tart. It's more like lime juice. Mm. Uh, it's kind of sweet, but it's more tart mm -hmm. and still has that fragrance of orange. Then I put a homemade grenadine. This is plum nectar, which again, I bought in the local grocery store. It's not hard to find. How do you make homemade grenadine? So it's a mix of, uh, you could take grenadine juice or grenadine syrup with water, sugar, and I put some other spices in it, like mm. star anise, some fresh nice. lemon. Wow. You just Heat it up enough to dissolve the sugar, right? So it's equal parts of liquid and sugar, uh, plus the spices that you like, and you're done. As soon as the sugar dissolves, it's ready to go. And then you, you once you make it once, flavor it from there, and you can make it any way you like. That's so cool. Wonderful. Right. And here and we have coconut milk. Ooh, Ooh. Now, and it'll be expected. creamy. Yeah. yeah. So this is. Um, it winds up, you might feel like it becomes a heavy drink, if you will, but it's not. What actually happens? Excuse me, one second. Mm -hmm. sure. What actually happens, it becomes very frothy and decadent without being caloric, like heavy cream. Right. Okay, so oh, this that's is excellent. virtually no fat in this one. I'm mm -hmm. using a, I'm using a uh, coconut creamer, so okay. it's got that thickness and richness of cream, but it's actually light and delicate. Okay. Easy on the tummy, too. I feel like a lot of people are sensitive to dairy. Yeah, yeah. You know? That's right. That's Easier. right. And so now this is what I do at home in pitchers, right? I just go back and forth. Ooh, that's really clever. Between two pitchers, mm -hmm. and then the, the guests have a perfectly chilled, I'm gonna stop here so we don't make too much noise, <laughs> have a perfectly chilled, well-mixed, wonderful mocktail. And then I would pour it in here. Okay, you guys eat your cocktail. I have Wonderful. to say, whenever I've been to a house party and a guest makes this custom cocktail at the beginning, I think they really have their life together. <laughs> They're so <laughs> grown up. I've only thrown one or two parties in my life, like as an adult, in yes. a birthday party and tried to make a drink, but I did not have it that together. So I'm very impressed by this. Yeah. And what are you putting on the top? So these are rose buds. <gasps> Beautiful. Okay. Fancy. So, Thank you. Know, you. You've got the rose water, you've got the rose petals, you've got the oh, coconut milk, so good. the grenadine is very fragrant, the blood orange juice. Oh my gosh. So, That's delicious. Love that. Now, you pour this over ice and have your guests add, and this is my recommendation, uh -huh. a local plum brandy. Uh -huh. So this is this is harsh. I'm not harsh, mm -hmm. excuse me. <laughs> this is strong. It's yeah. not, it's not mm -hmm. a mild brandy, but it tastes like plum and a plum wine. And I put a dash of each mm -hmm. yeah. into the drink, and now you have an alcoholic cocktail. So this right now you're so drinking good. the mocktail. Someone else but will be delicious. drinking a cocktail, yeah. and everyone can have it their way at their strength, mm -hmm. as a matter that of fact. I can see this being really good with like sparkling water in it, too, or something Absolutely. a little bubbly in there. Ooh, that's totally. Not me yeah. inventing cocktails. Ah! That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> What's the next one we're making? Okay, so the next one is... Um, we're going to switch spots, right? We're going to switch spots, if you don't mind. Okay, so this is a funny, it's a funny story. This is called falling up the stairs. When oh, I, I love that which name. I've done. Moved, yeah, it was me in high school. <laughs> moved here a few years ago. We bought a house uh, on Mercer Island, and we became friends with the the, the previous owners. Mm -hmm. And when they finally moved into their new home, this is the cocktail I brought to them. It was under a different name. And then we had a lot of fun, probably more than a few drinks, a good barbecue. <laughs> yes. And our friend Kristen Hart, who, uh, who who the next day said, oh my God, that drink was so good, I felt like I was falling up the stairs. <laughs> Perfect. And so for Kristen it Hart, this, this, is, this is her drink, okay? Perfect. So we're gonna start with um, similar process. I'm gonna put everything in the batch. This is simple syrup. Basically just a basic sugar and water mixture. Mm -hmm. Lime juice. Mm. Add a little acidity there. I do uh, you love gotta that have, lime juice. You gotta have the lime juice in. Okay, now, normally, I would take 
the hibiscus petals or the lavender petals. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, both hibiscus and lavender. Put uh -huh. it in here with some hot water and you'd make a tea, but since we're on TV, it's not gonna work out that way. Yeah. So I put some sachets, you know, and you're able Very to nice. drop it in, put the hot water, mm -hmm. let it steep for five minutes, and then do everything else I'm, I'm doing, and you'll have a perfect cocktail. Okay. But for Beautiful. the purpose of this and timing, I made some hibiscus lavender tea. We'll put that in. Beautiful. And so you see the color. Now, with this one, we're gonna use the orange flower water. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? Because we wanna, we wanna pump up the floral notes of the lavender and the hibiscus. Mm -hmm. And same thing, we're gonna put the ice in the other pitcher. Excellent, and you know, I've definitely made the mistake of uh, trying to be too fancy at a dinner party and I end up being the bartender all yes. night. So this is just genius, like, I really love that. Planning right. ahead. Mm -hmm. All right, so once Here again, we we'll just pour it back and forth. Mm -hmm. so this is the mocktail version. I'll just give it a couple. Now I would do this five, six, seven, eight, ten times. Oh, okay. You know, do it. Be generous with pouring it back and forth because you actually want the drink to get cold for one, but you actually want that water to dilute mm, really the, yes, and balance. It makes, makes it harmonizes, homogenizes all the flavors. It makes it really, really special. I love this. Awesome. Okay, so. All right, let's try this out. Okay. This is just so beautiful and a really great way to look like you have it all together. Yeah. <laughs> Whether you do or you don't, no judgment here. <laughs> I mean, how exciting is it when even if you're at a restaurant, you order a drink and an an edible flower or a little petal or something is in there, you're like, oh, we are fancy Very here. Thoughtful. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and this is just reminding me of the sunny, beautiful days that we had this weekend and more yep. ahead, of course. So mm -hmm. really perfect if you're like eating al fresco or something like that. Okay, absolutely. so once again, this is the mocktail. Mm -hmm. okay. And because I just got these in and they're so beautiful, Yay. you need an edible orchid. Makes yes. you feel like you're in Hawaii. Thank okay. you Ooh, so much. I love that now, way. If you want to do the cocktail version, this is what I like: is I, I make equal part mm -hmm. mixture of the mezcal mm -hmm. and creme de violette. I like the mezcal because it's smoky, mm -hmm. and but it doesn't overpower the drink, and it goes really well with the hibiscus. And then the oh. creme de violette, which will push the floral notes. Okay. I love both Beautiful. of these. So, this one is so my tasty. favorite. Thank yeah. you so much Thank for you. showing, showing us how to yeah, do this. Absolutely, and you can find more information on his books and these drink recipes, which are so good, on our website, Fox 13 Seattle com slash studio 13 live come back and teach us how to make more cocktails Anytime. in the summer and the fall how about you that yeah, yeah. Fall. <laughs> okay all right still to come here on studio 13 live have you ever thought about paying someone to do your chores well up next we're telling you about a man who has been ordered to pay his ex-wife for doing chores for 25 years Woo. we'll be right back <laughs> Hey, welcome back. How much would you pay somebody to do your chores? Well, one man has been ordered to pay $215,000 to his ex-wife. In their divorce, a judge in Spain decided that that was the amount that the man owed his soon-to-be ex-wife for 25 years of doing chores. This judge came up with the number by calculating the minimum monthly professional wage for housekeepers during the time that the couple was married. The woman argued that her exclusive dedication to the home and family left her unable to pursue her own career. What do you think about this? Uh, I think fair. I mean, honestly, I think that whether you're a, a stay-at-home spouse or a stay-at-home parent, I think that in general, as a world society, these people are treated very unfairly, like what they're doing is like a favor of some sort, or yeah. even if you want to do it, like you owe it to your family, which is, I mean, it's a kindness really that you're doing for your family. I think it's unfair that people have to give up their careers to mm -hmm. do this full time. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, absolutely well-deserved. It is a ton of money though. Whew. Yeah, but I was like looking more into the story and this, the man got $6 million oh. and she got nothing, which is why she had to like take this to court to get this money. So that doesn't even seem like enough money in the case. I just feel like our like society in general, I mean, this happened in Spain, but this could be applied to America too, just doesn't value caretakers and people mm -hmm. who are supporting other people in their careers. And I feel like every family makes an agreement, you know, maybe one person goes to work, but that doesn't mean the other person isn't working also. Right. They are also laboring and putting their time and energy and everything else 
into it. So at least she got something. I feel like she should have gotten millions of dollars. Yeah, you know, and a thing that is really frustrating to me, and it's so difficult to change people's minds on this topic, but I see it even on a, you know, young app like TikTok all the time. It's the war of I'm the most tired or I work the hardest. Mm. So often you'll see, you know, married couples where one person has more of a physical job, you know, uh, and the other person has an office job. And even then, there's the excuse of, well, you should do more of the caretaking, you should do more of the cleaning because I'm physically more tired. And I think that when we're in a partnership and this is the attitude we have, somebody is gonna lose and badly. And it's always gonna fall on the person that ends up being the caretaker. It's just so much labor when you're both working, or even if only one of you is working, you both live in the home. If you have children or pets, you both are supposed to be taking care of them. So I think that if you actually love someone, you wouldn't want that for your partner. Absolutely. Preach. Preaching. Give this girl more money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, at what point, we were just talking about this, do you actually feel like an adult? Okay. It happened yet. I know, right? <laughs> Thousands of, I mean, it hasn't happened to me, girl. Thousands of millennials and Gen Zers were polled between the ages of 18 and 42. 80% of Gen Zers and half of millennials polled say that they just uh, don't feel, they or they just are too, much to be it's grown up. Much. It's just too much to be grown up. Oh my goodness. And it absolutely is. See, I cannot read a single sentence. That's not a grown up. That was up. a tricky one. <laughs> we got you, girl. You're great at this. <laughs> so the hardest parts of adulthood are managing money. Yes. Saving for retirement. Absolutely. And being able to buy a home. Whew, girl. Mm -hmm. Yes. Finding a dream job and figuring out relationships. It's all just a lot of stuff. Yeah. And the poll also looked at certain life skills adults under 40 still don't know how to do. The top of the list includes changing a tire. Don't know. Nope. Uh, changing a diaper. Do yep. know. Yeah. Yeah. Sewing up a hole. Nope. Ironing. Yes. I'm like 50-50 adult. Oh, who yeah. irons anymore? I just steam everything now. Yeah. I just hang it on a hanger and That's steam That's pretty easy. Up. Hope for the best there. All right. Well, I got to say, you know what? Like, we were just talking about this and... I feel like in my 30s, as if I'm a teen mom. Yeah. <laughs> in my own mind. In my own mind. I'm like, I can't believe I have a kid. But it's a fine age to have a child. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know. Do people ever feel fully ready to do it, though? Or is it just you're like, let's just do it now and make it happen, too? Because... I think it just depends on the person. I yeah. mean, for me, it was a full like decision to have a child. Mm -hmm. But the whole time it was happening, I was just like, you know, and it, I mean, being pregnant. I was like, what have I done? What have I done? What have I done? <laughs> but I mean, it's the same yeah. if you're, a, you know, if you have a pet, I'm sure it yeah. feels overwhelming sometimes. Times I have pets, so yes, it does, yeah. you know. Or even moving out to a new city. It's all very oh grown up gosh. stuff. It really is. I bet all the time I'm still like, I'm not that good at being an adult yet. Like, there's always more things that I feel like I could do better. I feel like I'm just like hard on myself in general right, when right. it comes to that. But I feel like for me, when I felt the most adult was when I was financially independent. Yes. So after college, and mine happened quickly because I moved abroad and taught abroad after college. Right. So I had a job, I was like, fully on my own there and then I was like oh I'm grown up now and like taking my first international trip I felt super adult doing that mm -hmm. can I do simple things like taxes <laughs> and stay open my mail regularly not yet but you know there's certain things where you're like I have a lot of responsibility so I guess that makes me an adult room for growth room always for growth we're just gonna call yeah, it that room you for know growth, but we are fully grown-ups though we feel Young and vibrant. Young and vibrant. I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> All right, still ahead, we are sitting down with the lead dancers from the Pacific Northwest Ballet School's production of Snow White. Get a look at this family and sensory friendly show and see how the Pacific Northwest Ballet School is training young dancers for their professional careers right after the break. The Pacific Northwest Ballet School just opened their production of Snow White, and this is the first time that they've had two Asian Pacific Islander students share the lead role. And not only that, they are also best friends. Aww. So today we're joined by <laughs> Selena Fornell and Emerson Bull, who are the alternating leads for Snow White. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for having us. We are us. so excited Thank to you. have you. Now, you both uh, have actually performed in supporting roles in the past. Uh, so talk to me about how cool it is that you were sharing the lead now. Yeah, and we both grew up through the school at Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. Ballet, so now we are getting 
to do Snow White as a lead and we were both actually in this production yeah. in the past really? as like students so it's like such a full circle moment to get to be in Snow White again. That's so cool too that you guys are so close and you're able to kind of bond over this and like help each other out and just switch off night after night that's yeah. so awesome. <laughs> And I hear this version of uh, Snow White has an hour long narration. Talk to me about that. Um, so in like a traditional ballet, there's no narration. So you just see the dancers on stage yeah. and we kind of tell the story through our movement. But for younger kids, it might be a little hard for them to understand the story. Mm -hmm. So we have a narrator on stage who's also the king in the story. Oh, cool. So he kind of helps the audience understand what's happening. And it's also like shorter, so it's easier for them to watch and That's get. That's so helpful. Yeah. <laughs> and how many dancers are involved? Um, there's roughly 70 dancers per cast. Whoa. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. It's but, a lot yeah. going on. <laughs> so we also know that this is uh, special for like people with sensory, special mm -hmm. sensory needs. Talk to me about that. Yeah, um, I'm super excited to get to perform in the sensory friendly performance. It's a little um, different because the lights will be like a little more on in the house mm -hmm. and there's like a couple other things that they do for people with sensory issues and I just think it's so great that they are making ballet more accessible to everyone and I just I mean I know that ballet makes me happy and I hope that it makes everyone that gets to watch happy mm -hmm. so I think it's so important that we make it accessible to as many people as we can. Oh my gosh Wonderful. that's awesome yeah. what a good example to set too and hopefully more more places will do that now yeah. as well. <laughs> um, Selena you're part of the Pacific Northwest Ballet School's professional division which is really cool tell us about that program. Yeah so it's a two-year program that um, trains younger dancers to help prepare them for a professional career so we have our normal classes of like technique point and partnering and modern, but we also get to work with the company a lot. And that's so exciting and so special, especially for us because we grew up through the school and like we idolized Pacific Northwest Ballet. So being able to dance with the company and be a part of their corps de ballet and basically be one of them is so special. So. That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, once again, we want to mention it is wonderful to see two Asian Pacific Islander students sharing this lead role. So talk to us about what it has meant for you to see yourself on stage and to know that you are representing, uh, you know, to other young girls and boys who want to dance ballet. Yeah, I mean, I it's so amazing that me and Selena get to share this role as being two half Japanese dancers and um, I just think like it's so great that ballet doesn't need to be typecasted anymore and I think the narration that we're all used to hearing for Snow White is like skin as white as snow and obviously we don't really fit that exact narration but this year they actually changed it to like allow more people to fit that narration and Beautiful. I think it's so important that we make sure that we can all dream of being a princess someday and I hope that we can inspire young children that Absolutely. they can be whoever they want to be no matter what their background is or who where they're from. Definitely. Yeah. I feel like it should have been that way from the beginning. But yeah. It's so great that it's happening now. Yeah. And Selena, I know it's so cool to see the different costumes mm -hmm. and the set design. What's your favorite part of the show and what do you kind of hope people take away from it? Um, I mean, all the sets and the costumes are so beautiful, but I think my absolute favorite is the dream scene. It's actually, I think, personally, the hardest part, just because we do like two variations back to back, and then we also have a paw, which is super fun because that's like the first time the prince comes on stage, <laughs> and then we get to dance with him, and then there's actually a section where we like duke him out, so it's like you see him and then you don't, and Aww. that part's super special and fun. Oh, and I so just fun. hope the audience takes away that like anyone could dance and me personally like I was always inspired when I went to the shows so I hope to like inspire the younger girls that are in the audience. So. I bet you will. Yeah. yeah. So I definitely <laughs> want to hear from both of you on this. We are so proud that you are representing in this lead role but as you work on your careers and your future tell us what are your dream roles? Oh I mean there's so many. We're both auditioning for companies and sending in our videos, and so as we move to this next stage in our lives, like we hope that I get to do a lot of dream roles, but <laughs> definitely um, Juliet and Romeo and Juliet. P&B does like 
a more contemporary version, and I like fell in love with it when I saw it. And so I would love to dance Juliet one day. Okay. What about you? Um, I mean, there's just so many roles <laughs> that I would love to do, but um, I think Allegro Brilliant. It's a Balanchine ballet, but the principal, like even the Corda ballet, I would love to do. It's just pure dance, and it's it just looks like so much fun. Well, we yeah. love to see your growth. Thank you so much for <laughs> joining you. us, and congratulations. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes. I can't wait to see you make your dreams come true. Oh, All you. right. Well, to check out the Pacific Northwest Ballet's production of Snow White, uh, you can do that this Friday and Saturday. And we have a link, more information, on our website, fox13seattle.com slash studio13live. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks again. again. <laughs> and coming up, Cycle Dogs is joining us in studio to show us how to cook some of their plant-based dishes. Yes, and I'm really excited about this one. You've had it. You said it's delicious. It's so good. Yes, the Elote Dog and their signature breakfast burrito. We'll be right back. Hey, it is time for Emerald Eats, where we highlight some amazing food in our area. And today we are joined by Keaton Tucker with Cycle Dogs. Welcome. Thank Hi. you for having me. Thanks for coming in. in. This Thank is exciting. You. So Cycle Dogs started as a hot dog cart. Tell us about that and what the journey was like to kind of become this brick and mortar. Well, it was a long and arduous one, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, it was interesting. A lot of ups and downs. I mean, it's kind of how it is with small business, right? And you got to yeah. like, make your name for yourself. So it's yeah. weird coming from not doing anything like that to doing that and being out in like a face of something, which is something I'm not very good at. So I, I would say you're great. You are. you are great. Well, thank you. All you gotta do is feed people and they'll be excited. I know, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So you're 100% plant-based. Tell us what people can find on the menu. So we've got anything from hot dogs to hamburgers. We've got, um, we're bringing some nachos on pretty soon, which oh, I'm really yum. excited about. Yeah. We're, gonna we're gonna call them trash can nachos. They're gonna be served in a trash can lid. Oh, oh, love it. Like that sounds just like it. it's up my like alley. A brand new one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and then we've got, great. Um, we have some, uh, we're kind of becoming a chicken sandwich restaurant, to be honest. Yeah. Really? People come out for the chicken sandwich. Oh, that's our highest selling gross. You, yeah, that's amazing. You have a really good chicken sandwich. Thank you. What are yeah. we making today? Well, we're going to make our signature roti dog. I actually tried to take this off the menu when I first started the cart, and people actually came up to me and said, you just lost a customer. So no way. Okay. Put it back um, on the menu. They feel strongly exactly. about so that. Exactly, so I cannot yeah. take it off the menu. Um, and just want to toast up these buns for you. Yeah. That's great. So what goes on the Olote dog? So the Olote starts off with a buttered bun, which is kind of key to everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and plant-based butter, because everything is plant-based, Exactly, right? yeah. You yeah. can mm -hmm. use whatever you like. Mm -hmm. um, the bun is toasted. I do like a steamed bun, but this is kind of the cycle dogs. We add like kind of a creamy layer of like a saturated fat, which kind of mimics more of an animal product. Uh -huh. So it has that kind of savory experience. And then the hot dog, we use field roast, made here locally. Love it. Mm -hmm. They have a great kind of quality to them. That's beautiful. And I'm build it for you right now. Yeah. That's awesome. Now, Carly's always telling me this, and I, and I know that she's right, but I want to get your take on it. Mm -hmm. The fact that uh, this uh, plant-based meat products have really been elevated oh, yeah. over the years. They are, they are taken off, haven't they? Yeah. Has it made your yeah. job a lot easier? <laughs> I bet having That's good plant-based so. food. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. It's already Heat roasted it too, it yeah. looks like. Mm -hmm. Ooh, amazing. So good. What's right. been the hardest type of thing to perfect at your restaurant? Um, you know what, like venturing into new things, like when, you know, I had, like I started off with just a hot dog cart, had a simple grill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it moved into, uh, I got myself some deep fryers on a food truck. Ooh. So yeah, I started off with a bike cart and then got some deep fryers. Yeah. So what I was like, okay, what can, I, what can I fry? I started making like fried Oreos and like all sorts of <laughs> oh things. Oh my gosh. That I kind of grew up with, you know, like the kind of Texas State Fair type food because I'm from Texas. Oh, me oh, too. Yeah. 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 So, um, that is amazing. Ooh, oh that gosh. looks really so hearty. What we're going to do is we're going to add some plant based mayo. You can add Ooh. whatever. There's a few brands out there. I prefer Veganese. It's kind of, um, mm. yeah. it's got this great, like, emulsified kind of quality to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm going to add some. The seasonings. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. I'm going to add the cayenne. It's the lighter one here. Okay. okay. Wonderful. This looks so good. Wine. Fresh lime. That's my fave. fave. This reminds me, so there's a common kind of Mexican snack that's uh, oh. corn in a cup, you yeah. know, and uh -huh. this gives me that. This is this is what it was inspired oh, by, yeah. Oh, beautiful. And in, in the summertime, you can do like uh, corn off the cob. Mm -hmm. Ooh, and yeah. Just, and then have a little, you know, elevated version beautiful. of this. But yeah, this is, this is it. This is the Elote Dog. It's one of our 
probably one of our most popular items. Like, uh, we are becoming more of a chicken restaurant, but like, yeah. this, is, this is what started okay. us. So. so we want to try this, but we do have a second item to make. Yeah. We're making a burrito. Let's let's walk us through right. that. I'm gonna try this though mm -hmm. for sure. Right. So this is like spread out here. Do we just like pick it up like a normal hot dog? Or well, do you I would recommend using, but you know what? Since, <laughs> since I since you guys were on TV, I would think yeah. it'd be funnier if you just tried to eat. Let's it like that. You know what? You know we're what? gonna try our We've very best. All right, yeah, here we go. Right. Here we go. Mmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was okay. That was so good. It's in my hair. It's <laughs> not that great. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? That the food fantastic. is a winner. Mm. Oh my gosh, that's delicious. There needs right, to be more here, corn on hot here. dogs. I feel like that's not mm -hmm. a thing enough. You know, and, and we had another one where we put hash browns on it. And I, really? Some, uh -huh. some, I can't remember the, the where I got it, but this guy in this cart mm. in, a, I think it was downtown Seattle, he's like, hey, are you the guy that puts hash browns on hot dogs? I said, yeah. So <laughs> call, call a hot dog singer. And he, and he was like, that's <laughs> awesome. Your reputation precedes yeah. you. I guess now, so, I guess so. <laughs> I know the answer, I think, but this is not like a, Traditional Parmesan cheese, or is it? It's not, yeah. It tastes uh, like the real deal. That's why I'm asking. Yeah, Isn't right. That fun? <laughs> yeah. They know All what right. they're doing. Mmm, so, and so yummy. what are we putting in this breakfast burrito? This breakfast burrito has got I've got some bacon here that's made from tofu, but it tastes really good. And I got sausage. I can do half and half. Does anybody have Ooh. a preference on what? No, whatever Ooh. you want to make. You make it how you well, like. Well, I was gonna it. say you guys can fight over the one that you want. Okay. Oh no. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> And you guys also have an amazing cocktail list too. Uh, we do. You do I, it all. I, what are I some of the drinks do, you have? Yeah. Um, we like uh, so I I like junk food and craft cocktails. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're doing. So I'm gonna steal this from. Yeah. Them. Yeah. Do great. it. Um, junk food and craft cocktails are kind of like a big thing for me. And uh -huh. uh, we have um, a new cocktail menu coming out for mm -hmm. spring. Uh -huh. that we're very excited about. And um, we also do mocktails, which are really big right now. Love that. And low, low alcohol by volume type drinks. And you really do it all. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So you're kind of telling us a lot of the stuff that you do uh, while you're making this delicious breakfast burrito. Mm -hmm. But what are you looking for uh, to happen with Cycle Dogs? Do you want to expand ah, at some yes. point? Yes, we'd like to have multiple locations, even out of state one time, or at some point. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, it'd be great. We, uh, we have our eyes set on a few different markets. And I brought on a business partner, and it's been oh, an that's exciting, so exciting journey. Cool. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. All right, well, we are running out of time, but we will have the finished product on our social media, okay? Yep. We'll right. pop this on Instagram a little bit later. Keaton, Thanks thank you so much. We've got these recipes. So much more info up on Cycle Dogs on our website, fox13seattle.com slash studio 13 live. Thank you. Great job. Wonderful. Have exactly. a good one. Yes. We'll see you tomorrow. It's happening all around Like sunshine and through the clouds I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make your day